We're going to begin today's session, Romans chapter 4, shortly, but I'd like to start, friends, with a beautiful hymn. It's an oldie, oldie goldie, and uh, let's enjoy this wonderful hymn before we commence. I love you all. Beautiful, wonderful. That hymn was written, Charity Lees Bancroft. The lyrics of Before the of God Above were written in Ireland by a woman named Charity Lees Bancroft, 1841-1923, bless her heart, originally introduced under the title of The Advocate in 1863. Right, how wonderful. Let's start, friends. Just a very brief recap. Romans chapter 3 in our last session, <laughs> our last chapter that we were reading, just a few things I would like to recap on. We understood through reading Romans chapter 3 that Paul lays out the perfect plan of God through the death of Jesus Christ, that he is the only saviour. He lays out the reasons why we need the Saviour. He also lays out God's judgment, his righteous judgments, and how they are valid. And God is vindicated by carrying out those judgments on a wicked world who have rejected his goodness. 
God is the standard of goodness. He is the standard. And not only that, there was a few things that I wanted to mention that Jesus Christ not only is our saviour, he's also the judge. And before I forget, I think it's good that we go through certain scriptures just to bear in mind. I might leave them. Hold on. I might leave those towards the end. Please remind me to do that. So he's laid out the conditions that we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And we are all in need of a saviour. He also talks about, well, he proposes certain questions in chapter 3. He's anticipating his audience, which is Jewish, of certain objections that they may have had. And he addressed to those in chapter 3, and he provides an answer. So, wonderful chapter. And when we move on into chapter 4, in fact, we should probably read the very last paragraph I would say in chapter 3 of Romans <clears throat> to do a full on recap let's read this final portion here so he's laid out his case for the gospel now he says but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ you see the book of Romans is the themes are based largely on these two criteria the law and faith it's known for this right the book of romans is famous for these two precepts the law of god versus faith and in the next chapter in chapter four we'll see how paul is going to lay out the criteria how to achieve this faith and he would use Abraham as the standard, as an example. Let's read on. Through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And in the previous chapter, my darling friends, we also went through the book of Hebrews and I believe today I'm also going to be taking us to the book of Hebrews. Yes, we're going to also be doing that. Before I forget, let me just turn the sound off in case something pops up and it makes a noise. Because there's, a, there's also the book of Galatians. <laughs> in order to understand what Paul is writing here. And also it's the word of God. And we go to other books of the Bible. Because the word of God helps us to interpret what the word of God has written. So... Be prepared, take your notepads out and let's be diligent students. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith. And this portion is so much more in detail explained in the book of Hebrews in the book of Hebrews which is why we need to go there often when we study the book of Romans to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But of the law of faith. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, the Jew and the Gentile. Do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law because it was by faith works were accepted. Abraham required that he believed God. And as we will find out in the following chapter, how Paul lays it out. 
let me see what else did I want to cover here <clears throat> What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? You know, Abraham, and basically, he begins to illustrate how Abraham, because he's known as the father of faith, but he's also known, according to the, Jew, to the Jews, he was known as the father who introduced the circumcision. Even today, he's known for that. However, according to the Lord, he's known for his faith. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? And also, very important criteria, Abraham was obviously a Gentile. <laughs> Isn't that right? Before the law was given to Moses, before the children of Israel were delivered from Egypt. This is way before that. And this book will mention it. He was a Gentile that God called out from Iraq. Ur of the Chaldeans. <laughs> because of Abraham's faith, he laid out and set forth the example and the road map how you and I, my darling Gentile friend, would be able to enter into the covenant because he set the example by faith you see it's so deep this book that's why I had to take an extra day just to really get myself hunkered down into what is explained here and to really soberly ponder it meditating on this I hope you're doing the same for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Because works-based religions always produce pride, right? Pride, boasting, self-righteousness. For what does the scripture say? I love that. I love how Paul refers back to the Old Covenant, the scriptures from the Old Testament. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace but as debt. In order to receive grace from, from the Lord that is given to us, we've got to receive it by faith. It's not based on our works, right? Now when he's talking about Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. The scripture is Deuteronomy. No, Genesis. Let me see if I've got them in order. <laughs> I don't have them in order. Genesis 15, verse 6. Well, let's read this opening portion. Abram, this is before he was called Abraham. Look at this wonderful record of what Abraham experienced in his walk with the God that he never saw, but he obeyed regardless. He walked by faith, not by sight. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Wow. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing as I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus? He had a slave, a servant. <laughs> then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord. Abram, so just, just adorable that he's having a conversation with the God who just appears to him, who he doesn't know, and having a conversation with him. Isn't this marvellous? <laughs> and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, I always wonder how the word of the Lord came to them. Do you ever wonder that? I do. 
This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And I can imagine the night sky in those days without city lights and all this artificial electricity that we have, he would have seen a marvelous sight. What a spectacle. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Wow, you guys. <laughs> You know how long it takes for the Lord to fulfill the promise? He may give us the promise, but it could take generations for it to come to pass, which is what happened with Abraham, right? But he still believed God. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord, and he, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. You see? He believed in the Lord simply believing in what God said, trusting in him and accepting it. That is faith. That's the example. That's the standard laid out for us Gentiles, but also for the Jews. Because this marvelous covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, makes way for both the Jew and the Gentile to enter in and be grafted in into the Messiah. Jesus Christ he set out the foundation right here in the book of Genesis which is perfect in the book of Genesis then he said to him I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it and he said Lord God how shall I know that I will inherit it and please do by all means continue to read on this wonderful adventure that Abraham begins to embark on with the Lord. Going back to Romans 4. So he says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted him for righteousness. So at the very beginning, in the beginning of beginnings, in the book of Genesis, it was always about faith. You see that before the law was given? Isn't this wonderful? This shows us another glimpse into the heart of the Father. He wants us to merely trust him. And we prove that we love him when we trust him. Some call it blind faith. Well, the word of God says we walk by faith, not by sight. So, whatever. Amen to that. Now, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt we can tell already this is going to be a long video today i hope you're enjoying this as much as i am not only abraham is the example of faith believing god and what he said but also david verse five but to him who does not work but believes on him what does he even like what does he mean does not work does that mean getting a job no works based religions are just that islam is a primary example as well as judaism in its current orthodoxy works-based religions friends are gaining brownie points they think <clears throat> earning a credit bank they got a bank and it's is building up credit in order to achieve the trophy they think that whatever, whatever it is they're doing, even if some of them have good intentions and their motives are pure, the sad reality is that that actually draws them further away from God rather than bringing them closer to Him. Because the way God has laid out His ways of doing things, and this is according to His sovereignty, the way He's laid it out is that we must believe Him, walk before Him, faith by faith step by step he's very relational what is it that man can do what is it in our capability in our carnal frail human capacity what is it that we can do in order to get closer to god nothing you see that god says no mm -mm -mm. nope that is not how i've set things out 
But to him who does not work but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness, just as David also, David also, describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. David recognised how marvellous, how blessed is the person, the man, who God deems as righteous without him doing the works, that his sin is removed, the transgressions are dealt with, his sin has been covered. And he quotes him from the Psalms. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom, to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. <clears throat> Psalm 32. I knew I had the tab there. I was looking for it. <laughs> Psalm 32. The joy of forgiveness. A contemplation. Psalm of David. This is the quote where Paul was referring to. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven. But according to the law, friends, they had to offer sacrifices. Um, God's wrath had to be appeased. There had to be blood shed in order to restore relational service between the children of Israel and the Holy One of Israel. Does that make sense? Did I word that right? Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven because it was a burden. The law was a burden, friends. When the Lord Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, burdened, come to me and I will give you rest. Shalom. He was saying that the yoke that they were yoked with was a burden to them. And true shalom, which they observed on the Sabbath, would only be found in Jesus, in the Messiah, the lawgiver. He's the one who gave the law. You see, you see, the purpose of the law wasn't to bring people into right, righteousness or right standing. It was to show them what sin is, how bad it is. When there's no rules to break, there's no punishment, right? <clears throat> but when people break the rules, the consequences are wrath, violated punishments. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. This is just the way our Lord, whom we love, whom we worship, whom we give our allegiance to, he is the one who has designed this system. So we acknowledge it, we submit, and we surrender. Okay, Lord, have it your way. Your ways are higher. They're much better. I don't have any clue, any understanding. Please enlighten me. Give me knowledge. Give me understanding. Help me to see things the way you see them. Blessed is the man to whom, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Many times people offer their works, religious works, following rules and regulations, thinking that the deceit that is hidden within them, in their thoughts or in their hearts or in their spirits, nobody can tell. But the Lord knows us from the heart, you see. God, in his sovereignty, he had no problem punishing sin. You know, he has no problem doing that, pouring his wrath out on the earth. He has no issue. You think about the world we're living in today, and you're thinking, what is preventing God from just blowing things up right now because the wickedness is so bad? He doesn't have a problem with displaying his judgments. I believe the conundrum the Lord had was, how do I forgive man? How do I forgive their sin? You see, that was the predicament. But the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit made a way. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
the oneness of God made a way, made it possible for God to forgive us. You see, that was the problem. That was the conundrum. That was the predicament, not the wrath or the judgments. And because of his mercy and his grace, he withholds the wrath for a season, only for a season. So Paul's referring to this psalm. Let's go back. Does this blessedness, here we go. He's asking the question, anticipating his audience is asking these questions too. He's proposing, hmm, well, let's think out loud. Does his blessedness then come upon the circumcised, the Jews, only upon or upon the uncircumcised, the Gentiles also? Fair question. Hold on, is he God just of the Jews? No. He's God of all creation. For we say that faith was accounted Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised and he goes to the heart of the matter. He goes to the heart of the Jewish religious people who thought that because Abraham is considered the father of faith, connecting him with circumcision, they took pride in circumcision. It's considered as works. Paul goes to the heart of it and uncovers something that they probably weren't even thinking about, did not even consider. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Do you know the difference, my darling friends? Did you know this? According to the book of Genesis, God said Abraham was righteous before him because of his faith before he was commanded circumcision. Years before. Hundreds. Hundreds of years later, rather, the law came. Let's read on. Let's read on. I'm jumping the gun. Okay. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Do you see that? Do you see how the Lord made a way for you and me? Oftentimes, I know, I've hear, I hear about it, I see all the time, people think God is just a God of the Jews, and, you know, they hate the Jews because of that. Who, who do they think they are, the chosen people? What about the world? What? God had the world in mind from the very beginning. You see? Like I say, let me repeat that, if it makes sense to you. His predicament wasn't, I need to judge the world, how do I do it? It was, I need to save the world, how do I do that? <clears throat> Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. Who are the uncircumcised, friends? According to the scriptures, that we are known to be the circumcised bunch, the Gentiles. And yet God chose Abraham, uncircumcised Gentile, Iraqi, from Babylon area, <laughs> calls him out, and says, Now you walk before me, be perfect, I have a promise that I need to fulfill, and it's going to have a global impact. And Abraham says, sure I can do that and he received the sign of circumcision a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised that he might be the father of all those who believe do, 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 that's us though they are uncircumcised that the righteousness might be imputed to them also isn't that encouraging or what? That he had us in mind before the Jews. Hallelujah. You see, his ways are so, oh my goodness gracious, glorious. Lord, you are marvellous. Wisdom and might belong to you. <laughs> I imagine the Father, the Son, having a council discussing the future redemption plan of human history of mankind 
and then they came to this plan and said perfect we will do this <laughs> they've covered everything everything is covered everything's dealt with his wrath is satisfied sin is covered atonement's going to be made and the fellowship restoration of mankind and god the eternal father is restored hallelujah That he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also, and the father of circumcision to those who are not who not only are of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. Who's a Jew? We go back to that question, don't we? Who is a Jew really? Circumcision of the heart or circumcision of just the flesh? What about faith? You see, from the very beginning, God desired we walk by faith and be circumcised. The covenant was cut and blood was shed, which seals the deal. It took several years when the command was given to Abraham for circumcision. There was a delay. We could speculate as to what it was. Maybe the Lord wanted to see Abraham's walk. You know, I think back on... And this gives us hope, you know. When I think about Abraham, you know, he wasn't entirely perfect, friends. Again, another example for us that so we can take... Um, we can have encouragement when we consider Abraham. He was considered righteous. But you know, Abraham did some things wrong that God did not approve in the Bible. He, Ishmael, he fathered Ishmael because Sarah suggested, oh, take your maiden, your handmaid, and have a, have a child, an heir. This is after God gave them the promise. And Abraham also lies in the bible in genesis he lied about his wife sarah being his wife and they nearly gave her over to be a concubine <laughs> however grace and the mercy of god still considered abraham righteous because of his faith so we can take heart be encouraged we can't walk perfectly as much as we desire but the Lord will give us the grace and the mercy in order to do our best. Never abandon your faith in God. That's all I'm saying. Don't depart from the faith, friends. Our carnal nature will keep tripping us up, friends. But don't ever abandon the faith. Never do that. There is mercy available. That was just a little interesting side note, right? We think Abraham was perfect in all his ways. But no, he did mistakes, friends. And lying about his wife, that's not thats not like to be taken lightly. <clears throat> Going along with the plan that Sarah had, and then um, one of his mistakes was still dealing with the consequences today. You see? However, the father of faith, set the example for us let's read on for the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to abraham or to his seed through the law perfect but through the righteousness of faith for if those who are of the law are heirs faith is made void and the promise made of no effect because the law brings about wrath for where there is no law there is no transgression right if there are no rules to be broken, nobody is a lawbreaker. When the laws are in place and somebody violates them, there needs to be a punishment. So the law does what? It shows us what is right and what is wrong, which leaves the world and those who continue to follow faith works based religions, even the Jews today, Orthodox Jews especially, and Muslims. It leaves them in a perpetual state of, well, how much works do I need to do in order to know that I'm okay? Which puts the work, the 
the work or the burden of the work on the person <laughs> rather than responsibility on the Lord. And in this wonderful gospel, the Lord takes ownership. He does all the work. He's done it. He's It's completed work. I keep forgetting to go back to my notes. Hold on one moment. Abraham, known for circumcision, God knows him for his faith. If the law, if law keeping meant you were made righteous, then Abraham's descendants would have been disqualified. <laughs> True. The law came four hundred and thirty years later, in the book of Galatians. Should I go there now? Let's go there now. Let me see where did I put the book of Galatians, just to show you. Because this book is marvellous. You've got to read this as well as the book of Romans. Especially at this point. So. Galatians chapter 3. I want to read from verse 17. Don't I? Because I want to primarily stay in the book of Romans. But we're doing a lot of cross referencing. So. I would really strongly encourage you to read all of this book. Galatians. Because he's dealing with the faithful believers who were being preyed upon by religious Jewish zealots who were telling them that they needed to do certain things going back to the law and it was such a serious situation that in the all the books I think is this is the only book where Paul says the people who do this are cursed that's how serious this is because you make the work of the Lord Jesus, the work of the cross, irrelevant. And the Father is not going to put up with that. He has no tolerance for it. It took him his very best. He gave up his very best to redeem us. Who are we to think we can somehow, with our stupidity, our self-righteousness, we can get extra favours with him? No, what on earth? You see how foolish it is? Anyway, people like to stroke their egos. They like to grow and boast in their pride, which is caressing the flesh. And the cross and the gospel is complete opposite. It's the, it's the polarized opposites, friends. Anyway, let me get on with it. Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only man's covenant, yet if it is confirmed, no one annuls or adds to it. Here we go. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He does not say unto seeds as of many, but as of one, and to your seed who is Christ. So the picture was bigger, much bigger than what even Abraham envisioned that God was promising to him. His goal was to bring this seed who would crush Satan, <laughs> go back to Genesis, find out what God declared, what curse he declared on um, the serpent. He would crush his heel and he would bruise his, crush his head and he would bruise his heel. And to your seed who is Christ, and this I say, that the law which was 430 years later, That's how long from the moment that God promised Abraham and called him righteous. That's how long it was until the law came. 430 years later. That the law which was 430 years later cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before by God. You know how I like to see this Abrahamic covenant. I hope you understand why I'm saying this. It's superior to all the other covenants. It's the one that made the road map for the Jew and the Gentile to come in together. Yes. Was confirmed before by God in Christ that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, there's a spiritual inheritance awaiting those who were entering into the kingdom. This is a royal priesthood. 
There is a royal inheritance. We are joint heirs with Christ, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This is a kingdom. We have a citizenship now that is not earthly, it's heavenly. So we've got to renew our mind, just like Paul writes in the other in the other epistles. We have to really renew our minds. This is a new mindset, a new kingdom mindset. And we've got to really grapple with the way the world does things and move away from it, you know, and realize this is a glorious, kingly kingdom. We are citizens of this kingdom. We have an inheritance awaiting us. Nothing to do with the earthly realm, nothing in the physical. This is all spiritual. And it, one day it will become the most real reality that we've ever known <laughs> you know you might have heard of people say the spiritual world is more real than this world here everything here is but a vapor friends it's a shadow for if the inheritance is of the law it is no longer a promise but god gave it to abraham by promise let's read a little bit more what purpose then does the law serve it was added because of transgressions till the seed should come Keep the people as best as possible on the straight and narrow until the way is made for the Messiah, to whom the promise was made, and it was appointed through angels by the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator does not mediate for one only, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? Certainly not. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, which it didn't, it brought death you will notice he says this truly righteousness would have been by the law <clears throat> excuse me but before faith came Oh, sorry, I missed a bit. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And that's the heart of the gospel. Again, you see how many times Paul repeats this theme. You think people would understand and not misunderstand what he's saying. But people twist, twist his words all the time. It happens all the time. Let's go back. Now I've got to find where we were. Verse 16. <clears throat> Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace. We obtain grace not by works, friends. Otherwise it's no longer grace. <laughs> it's by faith. So that the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not only to those who are of the law. Thank you, friends. I'm so glad I have a mute on this mic. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord, for your grace. I do this by his grace, friends. Not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham. Again, the Jew and Gentile grafted in, who is the father of us all. You see, the, the foolishness of, let me just talk something about the political um, initiative. The Abraham Accords or the Abrahamic House in the United Arab Emirates with the um, State of Israel 
and the Arabs is foolishness because the main criteria is Jesus Christ. This is the seal of the Abraham Accord, the seed, Christ Jesus. So it's an abomination. The people who think this is a great initiative, Israel can have security working together with the Arabs. No, it's wrong. As it is written, I have made your father many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope, in hope believed. Marvellous. You see, it's the Lord. You know, you hear these prosperity teachers and they think they can do this, that they can call to life those things that do not exist as though they did this is referring to God this is God in many ways um, let me see God is operating in faith himself in the presence of him whom he believed God who gives life to the dead and cause those things which do not exist as though they did who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations. Oh, precious Abraham. Imagine having hope in a hopeless situation, friends. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever found yourself having hope in a hopeless situation? Amen, sister. How true. But look at that, Abraham. He looked at the physical and the natural and he said, how is this even possible? This has to be God. <laughs> Contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Hallelujah. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. But was strengthened in faith. Giving glory to God. And being fully convinced that what he had promised. Hallelujah. Help us to be like this father. Help us. Being fully convinced. This is Abraham. What he had promised, he was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Trusting in God, you are able, you are more than able to perform what you promised. I can't believe we're at the end of the chapter. I have so much more to share. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. And the us is Jew and Gentile. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up because of our offences and were raised and was raised because of our justification. Marvellous. The, the side notes that I want us to go through. Let me read my notes. <laughs> I keep forgetting my notes, my darling friends. This is from yesterday when I was going to prepare the recording. And I said, there's too much here. I've got to really slow down. Let me read. So Galatians 3 we read. Cursed is everyone who does not keep the law. That was the criteria. You see the perpetual cycle that the law followers find themselves in. Hence the sacrifices they had to offer every year by the high priest. I want us to see this so people understand that you can't, you know, there are those who keep some of the law. And the Orthodox Jews today and whoever is doing that are in a perpetual state, I'm sorry to say this, of continually breaking the law. 
which leaves you in forever condemnation. It's serious business, you guys. In the book of Deuteronomy, I want us to read verse 26. Let's scroll down. I did videos. Please check my playlist section on the Hebrew Roots Movement. I forget the title of my playlist. It's one of my oldest playlists. And it's, I have to say, according to the grace that's given to me, it's one of my best videos. The, the amount of scriptures I go through, that playlist is a must. The Hebrew Roots Movement or Torah Observant, something like that, the playlist. I have a ton of playlists, friends. <laughs> I'm not a one-trick pony. Let's read from... So the, the law is being broken down here. The Lord is giving the details of the situation of those who would break and violate his laws. Let's read from verse 22. Look at this. Cursed is the one who lies with his sister, the daughter of his father or the daughter of his mother, and all the people shall say Amen. This is like the, the covenant, the marriage covenant that God entered into with the people of Israel. And when was this? If you know the answer, type it down. We just read it a few moments ago. How many years later did this law come from the time God promised Abraham? Were you listening? Type it in the comment section. No cheating. Cursed is the one who lies with his mother-in-law, and all the people shall say... Amen. Cursed is the one who attacks his neighbor secretly, and all the people shall say Amen. Cursed is the one who takes a bribe to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say Amen. You see how the law is exposing what sin is, what is wrong, what is right. Verse 26. Cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. And all the people shall say Amen. Going back to Galatians. <clears throat> these are the, the cross references that we have to read in order to understand what Paul was writing in the book of Romans. Let's read from here. For as many, verse 10, Galatians chapter 3. For as many as are the works of the law are under the curse. You see that? For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Where's Paul getting all this information? Is he just making this up? No, he's referring to the book of Deuteronomy. But that no one, no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. By live by them. If you're going to be observing the law, you have to observe every detail, every facet. Somebody will say, well, only some laws applied to some people. Come on, are you being real? Wake up, snap out of it. It's a delusion for people to really believe that they can do works do certain things do certain rituals praying certain times of the days um ritual ablutions washing rituals wearing certain garment rituals praying certain times of day rituals what on earth do you think you're doing this carnality and the god of heaven who is holy has a certain standard and he doesn't even consider that for a moment it's always by faith because he's a relational God. He wants us to know him personally. And for that, our works are a barrier. They're in the way. And the barrier is great. <clears throat> it's like this great divide between you and your works and the Holy One. Get rid of the great divide. Come to the cross and surrender. That's all we can do. This is all that anyone can do. Everyone 
irrespective of background, status, gender, whatever. Surrender. Surrender, give it up. Lay down. <clears throat> Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. You see what he did? A curse was put on those who were breaking the laws and everyone was breaking the laws hence the yearly atonement Christ has redeemed us you know how he done that he redeemed us from the curse of the law and he's speaking to the Jews but also the Gentiles have got their own rules and regulations come on let's be honest all the non-Jews in the world with their own religious clubs having become a curse for us because the punishment had to be satisfied when something is a curse what do you suppose God does with it his wrath is poured out on that cursed object the cursed individual and who was in our place to to take the wrath of God, friends. Jesus, the name that is above all name, because he humbled himself and became a servant, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father in heaven having become a curse for us for it is written he's going back to the law cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree that the blessing of Abraham why? look at this friend does it look slightly That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. We think it's always about the Jews. Look how he thought of us before he thought of them. You understand? That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. You see this, I came across this wonderful, um, it's just a little snippet. And it's here the promise do you ever wonder the promise what 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 is the promise let me read this to you <clears throat> i came across this i thought it's really good so let me share it i'll read the whole article and i've got another uh, paper that i want to read it's an excerpt from a book but i'll read this one the spirit promised to abraham the holy spirit who's given to us as the seal of our redemption the token to symbolize we have been purchased by the blood of Jesus so when the day of redemption comes the Lord knows those who are marked by his spirit he was given to us according to the faith of Abraham friends this is so deep this is so marvelous anyway let's read Drift seems to me one of the most dangerous things in the Christian life. It's easy to drift in the wrong direction in areas of our life without even noticing. When we do, we can so easily miss out on what God has got for us. I wonder if part of Christian maturity is being able to take stock, notice areas of drift in our lives and then be active in addressing them. I've had to do this recently in terms of my relationship with the Holy Spirit. Over time, I had drifted. I hadn't come to believe anything heretical, but I had grown to overlook the Spirit's activity in my life, and frankly, I was often just failing to engage with Him. Someone being very forthcoming, very transparent about their walk, and pondering this Holy Spirit walk. When I noticed this, I knew I needed to do something about it. As someone who likes to think deeply, I knew that part of the way I could do this was to read some good stuff on the spirit. I'm aware that part of the way is a key element in that statement. Intellectual engagement 
is not the full answer. Intellectual engagement is only worthwhile if it then helps us with practical and personal engagement. And you know the Word of God is very practical, isn't it? It gives us the tools, the know-how on how to do it. It doesn't leave us without a clue. It doesn't set the standard and leave you to it, to it like you've got to work it out yourself. No, it gives us the steps how to do it. One of the things I'm reading is Gordon Fee's book, Paul, the Spirit and the People of God. You might want to buy that book. I mean, I don't know. Buy it. I've got a, a song I want to share with you, so bear with me. I'm really enjoying it. The reminder of the centrality of the Spirit in Paul's understanding of God salvation history and the christian life is increasing my thirst for the spirit and my desire to engage with him and he refers to galatians 3 what we were just reading from there have also been a few great aha moments including this gem on uh, galatians 3 so the author gordon fee writes this about galatians chapter 3 listen to this friends <clears throat> The promise of the Spirit is equated with the blessing of Abraham, even though the Old Testament passage does not mention the Spirit. Since the blessing of Abraham came in the form of a promise, this word is the one Paul uses throughout the argument of Galatians 3, which we just read, to refer to the blessing of the Abrahamic covenant. In a statement crucial to this argument, Paul says, the fulfillment of this promised blessing for the Gentiles is in their having experienced the Spirit as a living and dynamic reality. And I'm going to take you to some scriptures to prove this point. The blessing of Abraham, therefore, is not simply justification by faith. Rather, it refers to the life of the future now available to Jew and Gentile alike, achieved through the death of Christ but applied through the dynamic ministry of the Spirit and all of this by faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Now the other article, it's not an article, it's an excerpt from this publication. I think these are important. That's why I'm reading them to you. I'm not wasting time. This is taken from African Journals Online. I'm so glad I found this because he worded what I was trying to trying to put into words myself not only did the abrahamic covenant bring us in as jew as gentiles into fellowship with the messiah the father with the jews but we receive the gift of the spirit which is the promise of the father which is what the scripture says so dear brother authors i'm not going to try to pronounce that i might get it wrong so the book was the blessing of abraham seeking an interpretive link between genesis 12 1 verse 3 in galatians <clears throat> okay god promised to bless not only abraham in genesis 12 verses 1 to 3 but to also bless all the families of the earth through him. And in Galatians chapter 3, 13 to 14, Paul relates this blessing <laughs> as being bestowed upon the Gentiles through the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Amen. Look what's highlighted in the yellow. So on point. I, I, I have actually mentioned this, to, just to be fair, I have mentioned this in my old videos, in that particular playlist actually, the Hebrew Roots Movement. The Lord revealed this to me through reading his word about the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a part of the Abrahamic blessing, friends. Many prosperity preachers interpret the Abrahamic blessing as prospering in material financial abundance. They also assert that it is salvation through Jesus Christ that gives Christians who are Abraham's spiritual children access to the Abrahamic blessing. But when these biblical passages mentioning the Abrahamic blessing were interpreted within context of Paul's understanding of the blessing and using theological method of Bible interpretation, 
that incorporates a synchronic method of biblical exegesis with the sub-method of lexical and syntactic analysis, woo, it was found out that the blessing is that of sonship. Glory, hallelujah. The blessing is that of sonship through Jesus Christ by virtue of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the word of God says, and we will read that as we go along in the book of Romans, that by the Spirit, friends, we cry out, Abba, Father. Does this all make sense now? <clears throat> Let me read that again. My goodness, might be such a ooh, sinus issue right here. It was found out that the blessing is that of sonship through Jesus Christ by virtue of the gift of the Holy Spirit and not material or financial blessings. <laughs> so good, so good. Okay, going back. So some other scriptures I wanted us to read. I know I had Hebrews there for a reason. Book of Hebrews. Uh, da, da, okay. Okay, let me continue with this train of thought. The promise of the Holy Spirit, friends. I will save this for my next video. Book of Acts, right. In the book of Acts, chapter 1, right in the beginning... right in the beginning of the book of Acts and being assembled together with them he commanded them Luke is writing a recap of what happened just before the Lord Jesus after his resurrection when he ascended to the father so he writes and being assembled together with them he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but to wait for the promise of the father which he said you have heard from me for john truly baptized with water but you shall be baptized with the holy spirit not many days from now because he'd done the work he finished what he was um planning to do the crucifixion the work of the cross he completed a perfect work and now becomes available the promise of the father which paul is alluding to in the book of Romans and the book of Romans as we continue on in the chapters especially when we get to chapter 8 marvellous talks a lot about the Holy Spirit one moment thank you for being patient Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? They asked him again. <laughs> Remember, they asked him before. And he said to them, It's not for you to know the times and seasons, which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me. So let's ask the Father to empower us by his Holy Spirit so that we might be witnesses. <laughs> to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria so there's that reference there's also in Luke chapter 24 because he's he's actually re-emphasizing what he already told them Luke chapter 24 verse 49 again towards the end Luke you see he's recapping on what Jesus said Then he said to them, thus it is written. So this is what Luke is recapping in the book of Acts. Thus he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it is necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations. Because the promise to Abraham was that he would be a father to all nations, many nations. Beginning at Jerusalem, and you are witnesses of these things. So we go back to Genesis and then we come to the book of Luke and we're like, wow, that's how long it took. You see, God might make a promise, friends. It doesn't mean it's going to come to pass overnight, but it will come to pass. Surely it will. Amen. 
Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem. The promise of the Father is the Holy Spirit, and he is a part of the blessing of Abraham. That's all I wanted to say, okay? So, let me summarize. Where's my notes? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So, in summary, according to Abraham, Gentiles are made to come into the covenant. The Abrahamic standard, the father of faith, those who are circumcised, the Jews, can come in based on their faith. And the Gentiles, those who exercise their faith without being required to be circumcised, can also enter into the covenant. <laughs> right? God's promise was given to Abraham 430 years later, before the law was given. <clears throat> the Lord does not bring God's grace, but his wrath. So we don't want to go that route. We want to go via the the blueprint that Abraham set out for us and what was the blueprint friends Abraham accepted God's promise by faith without wavering it says he didn't waver with unbelief Abraham recognized he was incapable of producing the promised result right in his flesh it wasn't going to happen another thing Abraham focused that God accorded um, according to his righteousness told Abraham to walk before me so he believed in that and he was also anticipating the fulfillment of the promise so that is like the roadmap for us we we personalize it for ourselves does this make sense to you friends <clears throat> so this whole thing about the grace of God and faith and what have you. Grace only works when we have faith in him. When we, our human ability is diminished. Right? We have no human ability. Faith begins and grace is given to us. It's the exchange given to us. And it always results in glorifying God. That's all I want to say. How was that? Have I got anything else I want to say? I want to read these two scriptures, that's right. Remember I asked you to remind me before we end with a wonderful song. 1 Timothy chapter 4. I want us to read these two scriptures. I've got 1 Timothy 4 and I also have James. Great apostasy. Did you know that the great apostasy, according to Paul's writings here, is connected to religious spirits? Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. He's saying that for a reason. Because according to the law, certain foods were to be abstained from. But in the new covenant, what God has cleansed, he has cleansed. And that's the end of it. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. The whole point of Paul even mentioning this is to show there's a clear distinction now from the old covenant and the new this is why he's, st he's stating it because they were still being infiltrated by those who were of the religious workspace judaizers because this season of transition from the old to the new it took a lot of adjustment for every creature of god is good nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer James <clears throat> I'm going to read all of this portion 
Come now, you rich, reap and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold, silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the labourers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. You have condemned, you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren. Final word of exhortation for the beginning, the ending of my video. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. <sighs> take heart, take courage. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. There's a risk, you see, when we grumble against one another, brethren, amongst each other serious in the eyes of the Lord <clears throat> behold the judge is standing at the door the judge is Jesus my brethren take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience yep for our example indeed we count them blessed who endure you have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful Job was blessed more in his endings than in his beginnings. Hallelujah. And before I keep you here any longer, <laughs> I want to play you a song. <clears throat> One of my old favourites. It took me a while to find this version. I found this version and I want to play it enjoy my darling friends i'll be back saturday with my bible prophecy update by god's grace lord help me please help me lord to do this i'm so dependent on your help i can't do anything like this without him friends and um next tuesday back on schedule with romans chapter five enjoy this beautiful song it's just it's a special one for me i love you the Lord Jesus be with you always.